Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mike, go and punch that up, please. All right, I'm going to hand that to you right now. It's the slider switch on the side. I'm going to just push it up and make it be top. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks. On behalf of Mayo Clinic, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon and for your interest in learning more about how we are transforming healthcare through personalized medicine. So before we begin with a show of hands, how many of you have attended a Behind the Shields event? A few of you, wonderful. This is our first time doing Behind the Shields in Arizona, but hopefully not our last. Show of hands, how many are members of Dr. Mayo Society? Terrific. Dr. Mayo Society is a group of physicians, alumni, and senior leadership that have chosen to invest in Mayo's future. So thank you for your continued commitment. And the Mayo Legacy, how many members do we have? Wonderful. Thank you so much for attending. The Mayo Legacy uh, is a group of individuals that have chosen to leave an estate commitment to Mayo Clinic, and it's a wonderful way for us to recognize you for, for your support. Um, so wherever you are from and whatever your background may be, we welcome you. We also welcome those that are joining us live online. Uh, we are delighted that you all can be here and look forward to the program, which will provide you an inside perspective of Mayo Clinic. My name is Paige Perry. I serve as the Chair of Development. I have been with Mayo Clinic and uh, the department for 12 years now, so it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces in the crowd. As supporters and advocates of Mayo Clinic, you advance medical discoveries that redefine patient care, medical education, and research. Today's event is the last one in the, of several in the 2017 Behind the Shields that have been held on um, all of Mayo Clinic's campuses. But again, the first in Arizona, so thank you. Behind the Shields events are opportunities to experience a behind the scenes look at our most promising work. This is an especially exciting time. Let me see, is this one working? Can you hear me on this one? 
Okay, this is an especially exciting time uh, to share this work with you as we are in our final months of the most ambitious campaign in Mayo Clinic's history. This year, Mayo Clinic will successfully com complete the You Are the Campaign for Mayo Clinic with a goal to raise $3.5 billion for advances in medicine that will provide hope and healing for patients everywhere. The campaign runs through December 31st, 2017 and focuses on strategic priorities that provide new treatments and cures, support for the highest standards of patient care, and educate the next generation of healthcare experts. We'll soon meet a few of Mayo Clinic's leading experts who will describe the latest research projects and promising new strategies focusing on individualized medicine. And I can assure you, I have heard these speakers speak dozens of times and it never gets old. We're in for a real treat this afternoon. You will also have the uh, opportunity to ask our experts questions. So I encourage you to please write your questions on the paper uh, at the center of your tables. Development staff will be by to pick those up and we have allotted time near the end of the program for question and answers. And for those of you who are interested in learning more about Mayo Clinic, I encourage you to pick up a folder uh, in the foyer on your way out or to stay after and speak with a member of the development staff. We would love the opportunity to meet you and answer any other questions you have. It is now my great honor to introduce one of my physician partners, Dr. Brian Chong. In addition to serving as Associate Medical Director for uh, Development, Dr. Chong is a consultant in the Division of Neuroradiology with a joint appointment in the Department of Neurosurgery. He runs a team that specializes in brain aneurysms and strokes. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Chong. Thank you, Paige. Well, this is a particularly exciting time to share what we have to share with you today because we're just finishing up one of our most ambitious campaigns in the history of Mayo Clinic. So I'd like to start first by just giving a brief overview. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Mayo Clinic, how many have been patients here? Wonderful. and. How many have family or friends that have been patients here? So basically everybody in the audience has had a Mayo Clinic experience and a Mayo Clinic story. Mayo Clinic has been a global authority in healthcare for 150 years. Let me say that again. We have been a global authority in healthcare for 150 years. There are not too many organizations that have been at the top of their game for that long a period of time. So how do we do it? Many management experts have studied Mayo Clinic. They've written about Mayo Clinic. They've tried to figure out what our secret sauce is. The answer is pretty simple. Our primary value is the needs of the patient come first. We have lived by that primary value and we practice it on a daily basis throughout our campuses. Worldwide, we're known for treating very complex, very rare, and often very difficult to diagnose and treat diseases. We're driven by patients' unmet needs and we apply these medical discoveries sooner than other organizations are able to simply by virtue of the fact that we have a connected care system where education, research, and our clinical practice all function together seamlessly. When patients are treated at Mayo Clinic, they're not treated by just one physician. They're treated by a team of world-renowned experts. And that team are from across our organization. They're able to present comprehensive, seamless care that most our organizations can't deliver. This allows us to bring our patients, all of you, myself included, back from our illness and allows us to continue on with our life that we want to live. The collaboration is known as the Mayo Clinic model of care. And for that model, using that model, we are able to deliver a truly human experience to all of our patients. This is what differentiates Mayo Clinic from
from all the other organizations. And for this personalized care, I'm happy to say that U.S. News and World Report has ranked Mayo Clinic in Arizona number one in the state. And for the first time ever, we are the only hospital ever to be included on the honor roll. So we're the only hospital in the state to ever achieve that distinction, first and only. Just want to congratulate the entire team of individuals. This hospital is filled with teams of individuals that provide that connected care, the Mayo Clinic model of care that I'm talking about. Well, this overview helps us to understand what we do, but what matters most are the extraordinary results that we deliver for our patients. Working collaboratively in inspiring ways, we make the impossible possible. So a few ways that we do this is through our capital expansion. This is an effort to make sure that these talented teams have the space and the tools that they need to care for the patients who need us most. And this much needed expansion program aligns well with the complex treatments that we specialize in. This south expansion program that you see an artist's rendering of on the slide above really helps us leverage two of our strongest teams here, one of many strong teams, our neurosurgery team, who will present today, and also our cardiovascular program. We've recruited highly esteemed and talented individuals over the years. We just need to make sure that they have the resources to deliver that unique model of care that only Mayo Clinic can deliver. So to ensure this, we're adding two floors to the south side of Mayo Clinic Hospital. These two floors will contain the tools necessary for both our neurovascular, our neurosurgery team, and our cardiovascular teams. We'll include two revolutionary hybrid ORs in which we can do both traditional open surgery and image-guided surgery. And these hybrid ORs will flank a new type of MR scan, which allows us to actively scan patients even in the middle of surgeries at times. It will also include two operating rooms, which will allow us to provide cardiovascular services that we already provide, but also innovative electrophysiological and interventional cardiology service in both of these rooms. And of course, it will also include all the support space and critical care and recovery units that are needed for that. There's a great picture of one of the uh, innovative neurosurgical image-guided operating rooms that Dr. Bendock, I'm sure, is going to talk about a little bit in his talk. And here's our cardiovascular image-guided operating room that we are planning. So truly innovative care. Well, today we're going to learn about how Mayo Clinic is making the impossible possible. Specifically, we're going to talk about how we use the body's own cells to regenerate tissue. So you're going to hear Dr. Lott, who just walked in, speaking about his innovative clinical work and research work. You're going to hear how one of our research scientists uses mathematics to help us take better care of patients with brain tumors. And finally, we're going to hear from Dr. Bendock how neurosurgeons in our practice are tailoring their neurosurgical therapy specific to you, the patient. There's no one-size-fits-all medicine anymore. And so under the auspices of personalized medicine, we're going to hear a lot about regenerative medicine today. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Lott. Dr. Lott is an associate professor of otolaryngology, otherwise known as ear, nose, and throat. He's an expert in all things related to your voice box or larynx. And he's an innovator in regenerative medicine. And hopefully, we're going to hear a lot about how he can help those who have lost their voice box or their larynx to cancer. Dr. Lott, thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. I think my talk's coming up. You can hear me just fine, I hope. OK, great. Well, it truly is an honor to get to speak to you guys today and uh, to show off a little bit what your support has been able to allow us to do. It's actually bring some of these kind of new technologies into patient care. You know, so the, the future of medicine is actually being done now, and it's pretty, pretty exciting. So something I'm very passionate about and I love to speak about. So um, I'm limited to 25 minutes, so I'll try my best to stick to that. I could talk for hours, so, so hold me to it. But uh, So again, my name is David Lott. I am the director of the Center for Regenerative Medicine here in Arizona. 
and am a laryngeal surgeon by training. So today I want to talk about a little bit how I've been able to, to marry those two together. Again, try to bring some of these new technologies into patients. Uh, the first thing is to really explain what regenerative medicine is. And in the theme of personalized medicine, it really falls in perfectly because it's using people's own bodies to allow them to repair some kind of diseased tissue. And there's really three ways to do that. So the very first way is the top, <clears throat> which is regeneration. And that's using stem cells or other types of cells or DNA work to get those cells to differentiate into whatever tissue type you want them to be. The other part of that is rejuvenation. And that's trying to get the person's own body to heal itself in the correct way. So instead of after doing a surgery, forming scar, you actually regenerate new skin or new liver or kidney, whatever it is, and not scar tissue to replace that. And then the last part of that is replacement. So this is actually, I think I just lost my, oh. This is actually the um, ability to take a new organ that's been tissue engineered and replace it for a damaged organ. So in the uh, concept of someone that needs a kidney transplant for kidney failure, we can actually tissue engineer a new kidney that creates urine, has the blood flow, and is a functional kidney, and replace that diseased organ with a tissue engineered organ. So, and again, all these things are, are currently being done right now. The other way I like to think of regenerative medicine is kind of like the fountain of youth to some degree, right? So, um, you know, essentially what that is, so this is my youngest daughter, I have four kids, and I put this slide in here, part of it because she's cute, and I get the off factor from it a little bit, yeah. But, <laughs> But the other part of it is, you know, if you think about what she's going through at this point as she's starting to grow, so here she is a little bit older, a little more spunk um, as she's gotten older. Um, but, you know, what's she doing to get from that first per picture to the second picture? She's generating new cells. She's generating liver cells, heart cells, muscle cells, hair cells, whatever they are. So it's not scar, but she's actually making new tissue that is functional. And at some point, when we get to be our age, we stop doing that for most things. And we start forming scar, which again is after some kind of trauma or surgery, we get scar of whatever tissue is being damaged. And we've lost that ability to generate new tissue. And so if you think about what regenerative medicine is, it's that ability to regenerate, to go back to that stage of generation of new tissues themselves. And this concept really is, is, is taken off throughout medicine in general, and uh, particularly with Mayo Clinic. So Mayo Clinic has kind of embraced regenerative medicine as the future of healthcare. And the Board of Governors has, have gone so far to say that you know, Mayo Clinic is actually a brand of regenerative medicine. So, so trying to think about how Mayo Clinic is going to define healthcare from now to the future. And that's getting back into the personalized healthcare. So no more cookie cutter medications. You know, if you have high blood pressure, everybody gets antihypertensive. You know, why do you have high blood pressure? What is it specifically that's going on with your body? Is there a way to make your body change as opposed to just giving you a medication? Um, and as such, you know, Mayo Clinic has really been one of the leaders in the field of regenerative medicine. So these are all first, I know it's a really small slide and difficult to see a lot of these things, but these are all firsts within the area of regenerative medicine that have happened at the Mayo Clinic. So in terms of heart failure or congenital heart diseases, or being able to use regenerative medicine in, in utero to fix uh, congenital problems. Um, so there's, there's a variety, I won't read them all to you, but a variety of different things that Mayo Clinic has really um, become the first in. And we take pride in that because one of the things Mayo Clinic takes pride in is pushing the boundary of medicine and constantly trying to make medicine better for people. Uh, these, this is a list of the current clinical trials. There are actually more clinical trials than we could put on this one slide, but you can see basically in, on every organ system we have some sort of regenerative medicine clinical trial that we're doing that is actually out helping patients right now. Now of this entire list, undoubtedly the most important one is this one here, which of course is the larynx. <laughs> of course, right? right. So, now, funny little stories, the, the formatting, I, they, they, the formatting changed a little bit for this presentation, and right before I came in I realized that the red cursor was, was around retinal disease. So that joke almost backfired on me. But, but I, got it, I got it fixed, so now it's on the right spot. Um, so 
Laryngeal regeneration, it's not something that most people really think about. So, you know, I always think about the larynx here. So here's a picture of the larynx. And I always kind of think it's, you know, the, I get no respect kind of part of the organ, right, of the, of the body system. So he used to think he was kind of grabbing his tie. Actually, he was trying to get his larynx, but he kept missing it. But, uh, so Rodney Dangerfield even knew the importance of the larynx. Well, when you think about what the larynx really is, we don't think about it very much, but it's truly an amazing organ. So, you know, it's responsible for our life-saving things, breathing, swallowing, and protection of our airway. So when you're having a meal or you're having a drink or something, your larynx protects your airway so food doesn't go down the wrong way. It, allow, it moves out of the way to allow you to swallow and, and governs that whole process and obviously allows you to breathe. So those very important life-saving tasks are all regulated by the larynx. But it's also responsible for our communication and how we express ourselves and who we, how we define ourselves as people, especially for professional singers or professional voice users. And that's all based off of our voice. So just an example of that, watch, watch this kind of amazing machine in, or in, in, in action. So here's the voice box. So at the very, you can see it shaking, that's that thing that's shaking down in the background. So I have a scope in someone's nose, a professional opera singer's nose while they're singing. In the very back back here, and I can't see it real well, the vocal folds are coming together. Listen to the control, right? So pitch, variation, vibrato, right? Change in the loudness. Control of how loud that is. Let's listen to it for a minute. even at a very quiet level, able to get a very high-pitched note to it, right? So it does these amazing things, but it's also able to convey emotion to people, right? So that song, I, I've tried my best to cut that down because it's kind of a long, but I just love that song so much, I have to leave it in there, right? So it's worth listening to it longer. But again, that emotion still kind of gives me chills every time I listen to it. So and something that's so important in making sure we all stay alive, but actually defines who we are as people. So this is the part of our audience participation for everybody. So. What I'd like you guys to do is find someone next to you and tell them your name, you know, where you're originally from, and your favorite joke. But the one caveat is you can't talk. Go ahead. Yeah, there's a few people that tried. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, but think about that for a minute, right? So now you're asked to, to define who you are to somebody, to tell them about who you are, maybe show a bit of your personality from a joke. Um, but you can't do it. And so you feel kind of silly. I know when I've tried that in the past, you feel kind of silly, maybe kind of embarrassed, maybe a little bit frustrating because it is your favorite joke, you want to tell it. You know, whatever it is, it's, it's, it's a hard situation to be in. And that's just the inability to talk. When you think about our patients that have cancers and we have to remove their voice box, it's a whole different story for them. And it really makes their lives very miserable. So people that have had a laryngectomy where we've removed their voice box, right? So, now their voice box is gone. They have to breathe through a permanent hole in their neck. And there's no way to control your, your airway. So you can't get in the water. Right? So a rainstorm, a shower is dangerous. You can never get in a pool, getting on a boat. Any of those things are really, really dangerous for people. You can't protect that. So I've had people tell me they've had bees fly down their stoma and cockroaches and like, you know, that kind of stuff. It's horrible. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, yeah, I always get cringes too. That's chills for a different reason than the singing. Um, and you're, you no longer have your airway connected to your head. So you can't sniff when you get a cold, your nose just runs, and you can't smell. And so think about eating and how tight in smell is with, with eating. So it really destroys your quality of life. And that's just from the breathing standpoint. From the swallowing standpoint, you know, choking every time you eat, maybe having to have a permanent feeding tube and never get a chance to taste food again for people. Um, never sit down and eat with others. Again, a lot of what we do to express and have fellowship with one another is to sit down and eat. You overdo it over dinner. And if you sit there and you just have to feed yourself through, a, through your stomach, it's really not a great way for a lot of people to be able to live. You become very socially isolated. And the last part of that, even after this entire list, what most people tell me is the most frustrating part is 
their loss of their ability to speak. So just like we did with our, our audience participation part. Right? So if you can't express yourself, you can't express who you are as an individual, you really lose your identity. And so people become very reclusive. They don't want to see their friends anymore. They don't want to go out and play golf or bowl or whatever it is that people are into. They just kind of want to stay home. You become very isolated socially. Um, so that's the reason why, why I've taken on this line of research and this line of work is because I've seen patient after patient after patient have to go through this and see who they were before the surgery and who they are after the surgery. Um, and so, you know, the big part of that is to improve quality of life, to give people back the ability to smell, taste, swallow, and communicate in a voice that's uniquely their own. And that's the interesting part of the voice box is your voice comes from your head. It's not from your vocal folds. Right? That's, that's just a guitar string there. Your voice itself actually comes from how your pharynx is shaped and how the rest of your head is shaped. So if we can get this reconstructed, you actually sound like yourself. Um, we want to do this to try to prevent these surgeries for people. So is there a way to, when we do these surgeries for cancer, we can prevent them from having to go all the way to getting their entire voice box removed? And then lastly, it does save lives. So it's more than just a quality of life thing. You know, I'll go through that list with people and say, this is what your life is going to look like after the surgery. And a lot of people just say, no, I don't want to live like that anymore. Right? So if I have another alternative for them, then maybe that's another life that could have been saved. And then on the same vein, a lot of the cancers that we say are unresectable, it's not because we can't remove the cancer. It's because we can't fix the hole, the defect that's left there afterwards. So if we have a way to reconstruct that defect, now again, those are more lives that we're able to save for people. Uh, this is what our lab looks like. So there's a head and neck regeneration lab and a program that goes along with that. And there's an entire part of it, but this is just looking at what we're doing to, to translate these clinically into patient care. And so part of that is actually doing laryngeal transplantation where we can take a larynx from a donor and, and transplant it into a recipient. Right? So think about all those patients. There's uh, more than 100,000 100, people living with a laryngectomy right now. And if we can do transplants for them, we can give them their voices back. We can give them the ability to smell and stop and smell the roses again, you know, those types of things. We can give them that, that capability back. And we are the only program in the entire world here in Arizona that has the ability to do that. So we actually have a laryngeal transplantation program, uh, which we'll be doing the first uh, next year at some point. So it's just up and running. Um, there's only been done three that have been done ever, and we have approval to do 10 of them over the next five years. So. Uh, we really want to, to investigate this to, to better understand what the implications of transplantation are for people. And so again, we're the only place in the world that's, that's doing that. The other part of that is the tissue engineering side of things where we can use patient stem cells and, and um, scaffolding and things to actually reconstruct the voice box for people. So uh, I hesitate to put this slide up here because I don't like my pictures. You know, Mayo's, Mayo's very nice. Um, and I think this was their way of telling me that I was not meant to be a model, so they great, kind of blurred me out of the background a little bit. And they showed that, yeah. But actually, you know, kidding aside, this is actually what I think is important, and I think this picture says a lot about Mayo's character, um, is that you know, what they have in focus is the larynx, and that's what really matters. It doesn't matter who's behind the larynx, who's holding it. In reality, it shouldn't be me. It should be everybody in my lab that's sitting there. It should be you guys for your support. It should be the administrators, everybody that's gone behind five years of worth of work to get into this part. So I'm just happen to be the person that's sitting there holding it. But um, to regenerate a larynx, there's a lot of different parts that goes along with it. You know, you just go back to that picture that someone's singing. The first part of it are the vocal folds. So these are the vocal folds. And they're, they're amazing in and of themselves. And so they're designed to be able to open and close so you can breathe, get air into your lungs, and then close so that you can protect your airway and so that they can vibrate like a guitar string when air goes past them. And so they're designed to make a sound as air is going past them. And they have different layers that are designed specifically to do that for people. Um, when you look, you kind of that picture there at the very bottom that's open, you can see some of those different layers within the vocal fold that allows that for that to happen. And so this is what that looks like. So, here is the, the vocal fold on the left-hand side is, yeah, your left-hand side, is what the normal vocal fold looks like. So there's a skin layer on the outside that's kind of like saran wrap. Just deep to that is almost a jelly-like structure. And that's what's responsible for your ability 
to produce sound and create voice. And so for professional singers, when they lose their voice, they're getting damage to that area there. And just like Julie Andrews, that's why her career was destroyed. Is that she had a surgery and scarred that layer. It's called the superficial layer of the lamina propria. And that's that really soft jelly layer. Once that's scarred, we can not do anything to get that back. And that's why people's careers are ruined because of that. Then there are multiple supportive layers below that that are also important on the mechanics of how the vocal fold itself will vibrate and change. To the right, so on the right-hand side of that, is what we've done in our lab to try to reconstruct that. And um, as of you know, right now, we're really the only people that are able to get these distinct layers um, in the layers that they are. So we have the ability to grow the cells on the outside, and we have three different structures that form those three different layers within the vocal fold itself. And so this is what that looks like. Uh, you can see on the far left, this is just a, a slide, and it was called an H&E slide, of the vocal fold structure itself. On the right, this is an electron micrograph that shows, again, those distinct layers just uh, within that. So what's really more important is this part of it. If I can get there. So our structure is on the left in black and white, and the true vocal fold is on the right there. And so you can see with air going past those vocal folds, they actually have what we call that mucosal wave. So as air comes up between the vocal folds, it forces them open, and you get this wave effect, and then the elastic components of the vocal folds make them snap back together. And it's that movement that propagates the airflow out beyond them. So we want to try to be able to get that movement or that mucosal wave to demonstrate. I don't know if you can hear this or not. If I can even play it, let's see. Nope. Here we are. Let's see. And you can hear that real well. Yeah. Not terribly exciting. <laughs> yeah. Didn't sound anything like the singer, the opera singer at all, right? Yeah. But if you actually took the vocal folds out of that opera singer, his vocal folds would sound exactly like that. So again, all they are are two pieces of tissue that are designed to vibrate and create a sound. And then what your head, your throat, and your head, and your sinuses, everything, everything do is they take that sound and they morph it into the tone of your voice. That's why some people have really strong voices or higher or lower pitches to some degree, but just different tones to your voice is based completely off your head. That happens to be vibrating at about 140 hertz, so 140 times per second. And if you look at the male human vocal fold, that's right in that middle range. So most men, uh, their pitches are at about 120 to about 180 hertz. So it's right in that, in that zone, whereas women are a little bit higher. It's right around 180 to 220 for some people. So the vocal folds vibrate really, really quickly. You don't really uh, realize that they vibrate that quickly, which is why they're so... Um, susceptible to having problems. You know, think about something that's hitting together rapidly at 220 times per second, and in a professional singer singing maybe two shows per day on the weekends, and then practicing, you know, eight hours a day during the week, that's a lot of vocal cord vibrations. So when I was in, in Boston, we took care of a lot of, a lot of professional singers, and um, uh, one of the, the famous singers had come in, um, Steven Tyler, who's the, the um, head singer for Aerosmith, lead singer for Aerosmith, came in and was having some issues and uh, decided that they would do a National Geographic show on what he was doing from a vocal fold standpoint. And so we put some monitoring systems on him. And when he did his show, his vocal folds uh, moved the equivalent. So like a little inchworm, within a two-hour show, it moved over three miles. So imagine a little inchworm moving three miles in two hours. It's pretty amazing when you think about how much those vocal folds are vibrating. So, and he's been doing that you know, since 15, you know, for, for many, many years. So it's pretty amazing, again, the, the kind of trauma that the vocal folds themselves can withstand. So are you growing cells there? Is that what you're doing? We are. So yes, exactly. So I left a bunch of slides out for that. But so essentially what we're doing is we have the scaffolding in the three different layers. And then we have stem cells, the patient's own stem cells, that we seed within the upper we proceed on top and then within that upper layer. And I, don't, I didn't put the slide in, but you can actually see that they, they form that epithelial layer on the outside, and they actually turn into what are called fibroblasts, 
which are the, the main cells within that upper layer, that help to regulate the, the structure of that layer. And what's interesting is we can throw all the different growth factors and things that we want at those cells. The, the main determinant of what cells do, you take a stem cell and you put it in the environment, is actually the environment that it's put in. So I put growth factors in and I want a cell to turn into skin, but I put it in the middle of a lung, it's gonna turn into a lung. Um, it's really not so much how we're driving it. So when we put it in this, we actually will vibrate that tissue, which will cause those cells to change into to the type of uh, epithelium we want them to. And do those cells kind of grow into the pattern that you've got there just instinctively somehow? Yeah, so this, what we're showing on this picture here is that is actually, that's the scaffolding that we made to stay in that shape. Yeah, but there are cells within that. So if you were to take a histology slide of that, you would see the cell lining on the outside and within that structure. But really what you're seeing is how we put it together. Good question, thank you. Then taking that concept, and so, you know, there, the vocal fold itself is obviously going to be very important for singers or really anybody that's having some sort of voice problem, right? But now taking that to the next level is how do we put that together for our cancer patients, right? So how do we reconstruct or develop a new organ for them? Um, and there are a couple of different ways we can do that. But the, the way that we've adopted in our, in, our pra in our program is with 3D printing. And so the 3D printing, we can actually... We have a, a 3D printer that has the ability to print those scaffolds, so each one of those specific layers, and it will, it will print the cells along with the growth, growth factors in each of those layers as we print them, so it's called a, a bioplotter. It doesn't destroy the cells as it prints them, so you, you're literally printing off a cell-seated scaffold as it's laying those down. And it lays it down each structure, and it, and it cures it, and by the time it's done printing, you have this tissue-engineered vocal fold that's just kind of sitting there, and then you can utilize that for different things. So it um, seems very, very kind of straightforward and thinking um, at the conceptual level, level. This is kind of what it feels like when you're <laughs> trying to figure it out, though. Um, you kind of, there's a million things to do, and there really, isn't very, aren't, there really aren't very many people that are doing this type of research. So we have to try to figure everything out. You know, what, do, what are the environments the cells need to be in? You know, what kind of scaffolding do we use? Really a little bit of everything that we have to, to put in there. But. Um, to, to answer that question, this is what that process looks like. So we will take fat from somebody, and I always have willing donors of fat. I never have any shortage of that from anybody. Okay, so we can take it just like plastic surgeons do. We use liposuction through the belly button, and we take a bunch of the fat out. Um, then we can take those cells, isolate them, so separate the stem cells from the remainder of those other cells. And I have a, a video that I'll show you on what that looks like culture the cells out and then cause them to expand. So we take you know, a few million cells and turn them into many millions of cells. And now you have a huge uh, expanded culture of stem cells and you can start driving those to the different lineages you want them to go down towards epithelium, towards muscle, maybe nerve cells, whatever it is. And again, it depends on the culture and the environment that you're putting those in. And once those cell lines are derived, you can then take them and apply them to whatever it is you're working on. So, well, we're, this is a 3D printed hemilarynx. And so, in order for most patients, when we have a cancer in the voice box, it's not that the cancer has involved the entire voice box. It's usually just on one side. But the problem, like I said before, is the hole that we leave when we remove the cancer, we don't have any way to functionally make that better. And all you need to do is to have something there for the other working vocal fold to come up to. And so now we can take a CT scan of somebody and we can print off exactly what it, we're going to remove. We know ahead of time we can print that off and we can create this scaffold. And then we can put, you know, within that scaffold, we can, we can print that 3D vocal fold structure that fits within that. So now you have a vibratory vocal fold that's personalized specifically for that person on what their specific cancer was going to remove. Previously, you, know, you had a cancer the size of my pinky on there. Well, we couldn't fix that, so we took out the entire voice box sometimes, or at least half the voice box. Um, and again, when you did that, you really couldn't reconstruct things very well. So we work on the cell side of things. We get the stem cells to work. We print the scaffolding off based off of the individual person's requirements. Then we combine the two of them in what's called a bioreactor. And again, I put this fish in there to, to show that the bottom half of that is filled with fluid and the top half of, is filled with air. Because these are cells that go in your airway, they have to be exposed to air 
in order to differentiate into the proper type of cells. But they have to be within that bath of the growth factors for them to be able to survive and live. So it's basically just kind of a, a glorified rotisserie. It's just moving very slowly, and we're able to exchange that, that cult media culture out for people. So just over time, that gets those cells to differentiate correctly and to get into the right structures. And so this is what that looks like kind of in, from a video form on you know, what we're doing for, specifically for our patients. So showing, okay, so like I mentioned before, most cancers are gonna be on one side. So we have a cancer here involving the left side of the voice box. So just like we normally would, we get our preoperative CT scan. And just wanna congratulate the Mayo Arts people for their attention to detail and doing the male pattern baldness. I thought that was a very nice touch for this gentleman there. Um, so they go through, they get, they get their CT scan. We can then reconstruct that in three dimensions, remove what we're gonna remove for the surgery, print a mirror image at the good side, and our software, software will allow us to modify that then to some degree. We print the scaffold off based off of what the software shows us in that printer, which will actually print the cells right within it. Or we can add a secondary scaffold on that that already has the cells seeded onto that secondary scaffold. It's just taking the structure of that. And then, like I mentioned before, here we can go through, we can do the liposuction, remove the fat, and we culture those fat cells. And the really nice thing about adipose-derived or fat-derived stem cells is that fat cells will float and stem cells will, will adhere to the bottom of the Petri dish. Those are, they separate themselves for us, which is even better. They do all the work for us. So we remove the fat, culture those cells, make them expand to in, increase in numbers. Then we drive them towards those differentiation routes. We put them in our, our rotisserie. And that process takes about two to three weeks uh, for that to become an epithelialized layer. That's I think it's not perfect, but it's to the point where we can implant it to the body, and the body can take over from there. So conveniently, it takes us about two to three weeks to get somebody through all the preoperative clearance into the operating room. So by the time we take them to surgery for, to the OR for their surgery, we can remove the cancer and implant that new reconstructed voice box for them. And someone else that otherwise would have had their laryngectomy and had to have a little hole in their neck. So personalized specifically for that person based off their CT scan and geared right for their, their functionality. Um, so in order to do that, again, this is just one example of a lot of the things that are going on within Mayo Clinic from regenerative medicine. And what we're trying to do now is we've exploded kind of into what the possibilities are, and we're trying to develop that infrastructure now to be able to get a lot of these ideas, because clinicians are constantly having ideas, but the problem is, is surgeons and other clinicians don't have labs typically, and it's hard for them to, to push their ideas into, into clinical translation. So my job as director of RegMed here in Arizona is to try to make that more feasible for people, to be able to go from the concept through the bench studies, the preclinical studies, and then, then into the, finally the, the clinical studies themselves, and try to walk people through so we can get these ideas safely and quickly to patients so we can start helping peop more people. And we're doing that from different ways. We have people that can step in from the very beginning. So as soon as we get an idea that says, okay, we know what the FDA is gonna require for us to get there. So instead of kind of guessing and going through the process and then having to go back and redo things, let's develop everything up front. Let's contact the FDA early so they're involved in that. So we can again do this safely and quickly. And the same thing from the research side of things. Someone that comes in who you know, most clinicians like myself don't have PhDs and don't have a necessarily a lab scientific background. And so we have people that have the ability to go in and say, well, this is the way you need to design these studies to get them, again, safely and quickly into, into human clinical studies. And if you look at the very end of that slide, the, the clinical translation, this is another area that where Mayo is kind of excelling is that we have a lab where these printers and things that we need to be able to do to print cells and get them into patients, where it's called a good medical practice. It's basically a clean room where we can develop, develop all these technologies, print them in that room, take them right to the operating room, and, and implant them in the patient. So we're developing that currently. And then we're also developing what we call regenerative medicine suites, which are suites where people can come in and we have the equipment there that's clean and, and obviously approved to do everything. Um, so you don't have to go to a specialized OR room or something like that. We actually can do the, a lot of these things in the office. Um, so we're, at, we're creating a regenerative medicine suite or regenerative medicine clinic where people can come in and get these done 
in clinic like a regular doctor's visit would be. It can all be done in one time. So, um, Again, for people that are interested in, in helping out with these, is really the sky's the limit on, on what, you, what we can come up with and what you can think of ways you want to help. You know, there's always, always help in terms of endowing things because the biggest problem with research is constantly having to go over grant money and living from, from grant to grant to grant. And if you have stability within these programs, it really allows things to be translated much more easily. And in terms of the, the, the Mayo Clinic suites and those types of things, that is really putting a lot of these uh, technologies into play right now for people. So those are really quick, easy ways for people to get in and get some of these, these technologies. So that's my last slide. I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thank you all for not falling asleep. Appreciate it. I know you just had lunch a little bit ago. You put that scaffolding in, does it go away? Is it absorbed and, and, and left, leaves only the new tissue behind? So good question. There, there are two ways of doing that. So um, the one that we're putting in now stays in permanently. There are scaffolds that the cells will, over time will, will regenerate the new scaffolding material. This one, because of the, the outside of the, the larynx itself is made of cartilage, which is just a rigid structure. And so we can just print a rigid structure there to replicate that and focus on the vocal fold. It makes it easier. Yes? Um, how long does it take for someone, for this technology and knowledge to be immersed in throughout the, the nation? So you have to have doctors with your expertise and experience. How, how quickly can it be adopted? That's right. Yes, for, yes for, so what, you know, what the question was is how quickly, if we do something like this, maybe at Mayo Clinic, how quickly can it be adopted through the rest of the country? Is that what you're specifically asking? Because it does require a lot of expertise to do these things. And so um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, it really depends on um, the capabilities of the system that you're trying to get at. So let's say we have a patient that needs to have a new larynx at a small hospital in Indiana. What we actually have the capability of doing is we can get their CT scan from Indiana, create their larynx here, and ship that back to Indiana. So the surgical part of it really honestly isn't terribly difficult. Uh, and I'm saying that as a surgeon, downgrading my, my, my abilities to some degree, but you know, that's really not the hard part. The hard part is making the system. And so if, if they don't have the capability wherever the patient needs it, Mayo has the capability of doing that to, to provide for them. But if the demand grows with the future, if, as the demand grows, would the future be that they have to do an internship for three years working with you before, I mean, I wouldn't go to Indiana and say, here, they're going to mail me this right. structure. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, right, yeah. Um, yes, but you know, it, it really is getting to the point, so Mayo Clinic now has a, uh, a postdoctoral program. All the medical students here at, at Mayo Clinic can get um, a coursework in regenerative medicine and working on getting a master's. And so it's really being integrated into medical care education now. Um, but you're right, to, to some extent, there are going to be limitations just because people haven't been trained in that before. So yeah, it, it really isn't that um, somebody could just, hey, I'm gonna do regenerative medicine surgery today. Um, that would have to be under some kind of guidance, just like any surgeon wouldn't just say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do brain surgery today, just for the fun of it. You know, it's, you have to have that kind of that expertise in it. Yeah, it's a great question, though. Thank you. Do you work closely with Cleveland Clinic and outfits like that? Because they're doing the same thing you're doing. Because they're doing the same thing what we're doing? It's Cleveland Clinic. I'm sure you're familiar with them. I, I actually did my residency at the Cleveland Clinic, right. which is where all of my interests. So, yeah, so my, my former chairman, who's my, my mentor there, is the person that did the very first laryngeal transplantation there in Cleveland Clinic. So they're, actually they're programmed to some degree. Um, they're, really, they're not doing any more transplantations there. There aren't, isn't any place else in the country. So we've kind of adopted that from them. Uh, they're not doing a whole lot in terms of regenerative medicine. They're focusing from the laryngeal side of things um, on, on mostly surgical outcomes and different surgeries that they can do. But the Cleveland Clinic's research program does have a lot of people in the regenerative medicine space, and yes, we do work with them quite a bit. Yeah, you're welcome. It's a great question. question. I think she has one here. Yeah. Yeah, how many of these partial um, uh, larynx 
re replacements are you doing right now? And what do you envisage in the way of growth over the next five years? Yeah. What would you like to see? Well, right now, we're, we're still with the FDA. So we have, we're in the final phases of working with the FDA. We have all our background data and everything squared away. So we're set to start doing these uh, for patients early next year. I'm actually doing the surgery with the printed scaffold without the cells for somebody in a month. But the, the cell part of it, is, it takes a little longer to get through the FDA. Um, but the goal, again, is really anybody with cancer, there aren't very many um, boundaries to prevent us from doing this for people once we prove that, yes, it is safe to do for people. And it's relatively straightforward from a CT scan to scaffolding standpoint. So I hope the adoption is very quick. Yes, for anybody with any kind of laryngeal dysfunction, the concept would be it for anybody. Yeah, and there's, that's actually where a lot of the research has come from to date is from pediatrics, from kids that have had uh, trachea problems and trying to work with them to, to get the trach tubes and things out. So that's where a lot of this interest initiated. Yeah. Uh-huh. Do you fully explain to them what the results are going to be in all probability, what they're going to be? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So the question is, when we work in this area, do we fully explain people what the results are going to be? Absolutely. So the, the worst thing I can do as a physician is to sell somebody false hope. And so usually what I do is I actually try to talk them out of it to some degree and say, you know, by the time most people are ready for this, it's their last resort. And so what I'll say is, I can never, ever guarantee that this is going to be a benefit for you. The, but the big benefit of this type of surgery for this specific organ is if the implant doesn't work or the transplant doesn't work, they end up with a laryngectomy, which is where they would have been to begin with. So other than losing time, having gone through other procedures, those types of things, they haven't lost a whole lot. Much different than a heart transplant. If your heart transplant doesn't work, you're in trouble. Right, your larynx transplant doesn't work. You're right off where you would have been. But yeah, I make very, very uh, clear details on what people are going to go through when they go through these surgeries. Yeah. Hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and then that, that's part of it is that everybody does respond differently. And that's another thing, another point that I make to people is I can tell you, based off of my experience, what most people are going to go through. But because medicine is personalized, going back to the theory of, to the, the idea of this meeting, is everybody responds to surgeries differently also. And so we'll be there to help you get through whatever it is you're going through, but we can't guarantee it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Most people, I'm sure, are in the same position I'm in. Uh, but we live to eat. Yes. We don't eat to live. We, you know, yes. uh, I mean, I should, I put it the other way because mm -hmm. we've got to survive. But you lose all your taste buds. Consequently, uh, most people sit down and they really relish the taste of food. Yeah. And of course, we people in my situation. We look at it as a survival method. Yeah. So yeah, I'll answer that question. I think there's one other question here too. But um, my guess, not knowing your history, is you probably have had radiation. The other benefit with um, with these surgeries is the reason we do radiation is because it prevents us from making the holes that we can't reconstruct. And so if we can then now reconstruct those defects, a lot of people will be saved from the downsides of radiation because it's it's not that you have to have radiation. Because of the cancer, it's, it's surgery or radiation. And a lot of times radiation is chosen because the, the drawbacks from radiation are less than surgery. But if we can switch that balance towards surgery, then the problem with the taste buds go away. Yes. Doctor, can you explain in layman's terms, and maybe it isn't possible, what you mean when you say you print? When I think of printing, I think of a Xerox machine with paper coming. Yes, good. Yeah, thank you. Yes. So, yeah, the real term for 3D printing is actually called additive manufacturing. So what it is, is to kind of think about the, the inkjet printers. You know, they would go around and they would give out a little bit of ink as it was go through. And in fact, that's what the first 3D printers were, were inkjet printers that they put a different substrate in and they would just print out. 
So it would just it'll extrude a little bit of whatever it is you're printing, plastic, hyaluronic acid, metal, titanium, you can print any of these things. So it'll lay a little bit of titanium down in the line. Let's say you're just trying to make a straight wall. It'll put titanium down, let that settle so it cools down. It'll put another layer on top of it, and eventually you have this wall that's built up onto one another. And they can do that in any three-dimensional structure you want. There are people that have literally printed th cars, 3D printed cars, 3D printed houses. You can, there's nothing you can't 3D print just depending on the size of your printer. So it's just a big robot, robotic arm that strategically puts little dots of whatever substrate wherever you want it, and it builds on itself. And yours is cells. Ours is cells and um, the substrate itself. So that vocal fold, that scaffolding, it actually prints those off, but it has the ability to put the cells within that substrate while it prints it. Yeah, thank you for I should have clarified that a little bit more. It doesn't just do babies. I was just wondering if um, the proton beam radiation is involved with any of this, or is that not used? Or if it's yeah, no, that's, that's a good question, yeah. So the, the nice thing about what some of the downfall is with radiation is over time this has gotten better, but it used to be they would send a big area of radiation towards the voice box or towards the tongue or, or whatever it is. And so it would be great for destroying the tumor, but it wasn't specific enough to only destroy the tumor. So there would be some other types of tissue that would get destroyed in, in as a byproduct, like taste buds, for example. Um, what these new technologies like proton beam are doing is they're getting much more specific. And so it helps to preserve the surrounding tissues um, and only really destroying the, the cancer itself. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Dr. Lott here, aren't we? Um, that question uh, regarding Cleveland Clinic was a wonderful question. I love that question because it's a great example of what the Mayo brothers believed in. In the early days, they would have what they called clinics, and they would travel around the world, and they would learn from other physicians and scientists around the world, and they would bring the best of what they learned back to Mayo Clinic. And Dr. Lott's a great example of that. He heads up our regenerative medicine program. He brought the skills he learned from Cleveland Clinic to Mayo Clinic, and we're so happy to have him here. As an educator, I think one of the, one of the most famous, uh, impactful sayings that I can remember from my mentors is we're only as good as the people that we train, meaning that the people that we train go out and become better than we do. And that, that's the hugest compliment ever. So that is part and parcel of the Mayo culture. Um, I want to introduce our next speaker, who I'm also very, very proud and fortunate personally to have him here. Dr. Bernard Bendock is our William and Charles Mayo Chair of Neurosurgery, and he's also, more importantly, a good friend and a colleague of mine. Uh, in the spirit of Mayo collaboration, uh, when Dr. Bendock came here, he only made us better, and he made me better, because our cross-cultural collaboration, our scientific collaborations, and our clinical collaborations have allowed us to treat our Mayo Clinic patients the way we love to treat them, and that is the best possible way that we can. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Bendock, please. Good afternoon, everyone. It's really a great honor to be here with you today uh, to talk about two of my favorite topics, Mayo Clinic and the human brain, and what we're going to do to create a better future uh, in this area for both Mayo Clinic patients and, and for brain health. So precision surgery, today's dream, tomorrow's reality. I think this may have, uh, this is a dream continued on from the Mayo brothers, and I'll touch on that. 
This is uh, our neurosurgery department. This is a little outdated from uh, about six months ago. Our department has grown maybe double in size since this picture was taken. So the human brain, perhaps the most spectacular, magnificent uh, computer that we're aware of in uh, the known universe. Uh, uh, One billion neurons. Each neuron has 30,000 connections. If you had that many connections on Facebook, your life would be in big trouble. <laughs> what are the products of this human brain? You know, great art. Uh, this is, uh, Michelangelo was fascinated with the human brain, and here you see the human brain is the cloud that his vision of God is on, and touching Adam, uh, that neuronal connectivity, perhaps, uh, that, he, uh, that he sort of started thinking about. But really inspired by neuroanatomy, uh, really the anatomic dissections in the Renaissance were really what inspired the, that, that uh, great progress in, uh, in, in sculpting and, uh, and architecture and uh, art. And then these, these great paintings that many of you are familiar with, these are all products of the human brain. Sistine Chapel, uh, amazing art. This same brain is going to take us to Mars and beyond. Uh, and somewhere built in our genes is that desire to leave Eastern Africa, populate the globe, and to always explore new frontiers. One of the strengths of the human species is our ability to gather around a campfire. You know, in the Eastern African Sahara, the, we were probably not the strongest species. Not, we were probably the more, one of the more vulnerable species, in fact. But working in a team, we're essentially unbeatable. And what we cannot lose as we look to the future, and we're all glued to our iPads and iPhones, is this: that our strength really comes from gathering around the dinner table on Sunday or the quote-unquote campfire to really uh, conspire uh, in, in a good way. And really plan our future. And, and planning the future is a mountain climb. We don't advance. Uh, uh, progress and evolution is not guaranteed. Uh, after the Egyptian uh, Renaissance and the pyramids came a very dark period in human history. We should never forget that the Dark, dark Ages came after the... You, one walk through Rome, and, you, and it's, it's puzzling to see why the Dark Ages came after all that. So it's not guaranteed that we're always going to be going up and forward. We have to have a good plan, and we have to really have a... Uh, after gathering on that campfire, really have a strategy and the right tactics to move forward. So there are threats, uh, this hu beautiful human brain, there are threats against the human brain. We can suffer from strokes, brain aneurysms, degenerative diseases, our spines can degenerate. Uh, we can suffer from cancer of the human brain, and these are all threats uh, against this uh, beautiful organ. So this is an example. Our job uh, in neurosurgery, our job is to be the fire department uh, of the human brain and the spinal cord. And this is just one complex case where there was a meningioma pressing on the spinal cord just as it connected with the brain. And here it is working as a team, Mayo Clinic style, working multiple surgeons, multiple team members in the OR, working to get it done, to take out that tumor. We do that today, but how can we do it better? And so what I'm going to propose and what Dr. Chong and I have been working on for the last couple of years is this idea of moving from the current state of surgery, which I would, which I would uh, describe as akin to driving without GPS, in, in uh, medical school, you learn anatomy. Turn right by the fire hydrant, left by the church, drive, go down the alley and by the theater, then you get to the other home. Uh, and then you get GPS, and what about real-time GPS where you have real-time data? And same with surgery, and we're taught in medical school, you know, when you're operating on a knee, find that ligament, turn right, go up a little bit, and you're gonna find the pathology. Well, what if you could operate uh, with real-time imaging and know exactly where you're going? You can start to do a lot of great things, which I'm gonna show you. So the, the proposal here is to move from traditional surgery to pre, uh, precision individualized surgery. And what are the characteristics? Whenever you're thinking about a revolution, you have to think about the characteristics of that revolution. Precision individualized surgery should be safe. We all want that. Less invasive. Everyone wants that. Patient specific, designed for you, the right choice, uh, the right procedure, efficient, predictable, and of course with a great outcome and great quality of life. I'll pause here for a moment. If you think about healthcare over the last 200 years, in the last 100 years we made people live longer. We've done a good job of making people live to 100, uh, uh, but the real challenge is to make people live better. Are we living with quality of life? And as soon as we f figure out the telomeres that I hope David Lott will help us figure out, we may live to 200. That may be seen within our lifetimes. You never know. So individualized neurosurgery is very important. In neurosurgery, my field, because small errors mean, can mean life or death. One millimeter off with a brain, during brain surgery, you could kill a patient or maim them or, uh, or leave them even worse than death, disabled. And so it's very important, but it's actually important in all areas of neurosurgery. That stuff that Dr. David Lott is doing, stuff that uh, cardiac surgeons do, all requires precision, uh, prostate surgery, knee surgery, et cetera. 
The current status today is conventional surgery. It's uh, basically average patient, average treatment. You give options to the patient. The patient often has to choose between confusing options. Surgery without practice is the norm. Operating based on anatomic knowledge, which is fine, but it's not as precise as it should be. And no integration. We have a lot of technologies being every year. We're seeing multiple technologies come to the market, but it's not well integrated. So I, I often ask myself when driving into work, if we took down the sign of Mayo Clinic, would we still be special? So we, Dr. David Lott and I and Dr. Chong have the job of, when we drive into work every day, say, so how do we make this place special every day? And that's, that's going back to what Dr. Chong said about the 150 years of success. It's that constant, we constantly challenge ourselves to be better. And would the Mayo brothers, if they came and visited today, would they be proud of what we're doing? Would they appreciate and, 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 and really approve of what we're doing? And that's, that's the challenge we have every day. Here's the Mayo brothers operating over about 100 years ago. Uh, and they, at, the, at their time, they were the, way ahead of the field, in part because of what Dr. Chong talked about, that ability to, to gather and collect data from around the world and bring it back to Mayo Clinic. So what's the road to precision surgery? Conventional, I, and I'm going to propose that there are several steps we're going to need to take up that mountain that I described earlier to get there. One is simulation science. The second is mapping the brain, imaging during surgery to get, get us to become more precise, and then operating in an MR scanner, robotics, and then some, I'll, I'll touch on some technology innovations. So simulation science. The, uh, how do we treat the patient before they arrive to Mayo Clinic? So I'm going to give you the example of a 65-year-old patient who's living in Europe who was just diagnosed with a brain aneurysm. Uh, and they see a number of doctors, and the first doctor says, yeah, you should just leave the aneurysm alone. Aneurysm is a, can be a ticking time bomb. And the second doctor says you should do surgery and clip the aneurysm. The second, third doctor says, uh, no, there's a, another way to do it that's coiling the, coil the aneurysm. And the patient is left totally confused, so they call Mayo Clinic. And this is a very common scenario. And they can send us a scan. We can print the aneurysm and see it in three dimensions and play with the aneurysm, understand how to treat it, and come up perhaps with the, with the best option that's going to work for the patient. And we can use a number of tools to get there. This is just one way of doing it. We can actually print the aneurysm and clip it. We can simulate, put it in a machine, and actually coil it. We can study the hemodynamics of the aneurysm. And I'm going to show you here something very interesting. We actually printed this one patient's aneurysm. On the left, you're going to see the real treatment. On the right, you're going to see it done in a model. So we can practice the week before, the day before, not just as a surgeon, but with your whole team. So when you arrive to the OR, you've already seen that play. It's like an athlete going up to bat, and they've already seen that pitch. They've already been there. And so that is a huge advantage. And here you see on the right, we're coiling the toy. On the left, we're, coil it, we're putting coils in the aneurysm. And the advantage there is if you've already done it, you already know the working view, you already know the best devices that are going to work, you're probably going to shave off half the procedure. It's probably going to be safer. And here we can practice also on physical models, doing more sophisticated things. And now with holography, that's a new frontier for us. I wish I had this toy in medical school. Now the students can pick up a hologram and study different fractures. We're trying to bring that science into surgery so that we can uh, not only advance the knowledge and the practice, we won't even need to 3D print in the future. We can just work on a hologram. This is a student manipulating a hologram of the heart. Uh, I had to read about a thousand uh, page book to even, uh, absorb just one percent of that knowledge. So, so here we go back to the patient. So we now bring this simulation back to the clinic and really share our knowledge with the patient. And here is a patient who came to us about a couple months ago, had this aneurysm that we printed. And now we can actually have her treat her own aneurysm. So we're explaining this to her. And, and really this allow, demystifies. We brought the tools to the clinic. The patient can actually hold the surgical instruments. And, and really see her aneurysm in 3D. And actually, we can teach her in a couple minutes how to do, how to do the procedure. And here she's asking questions. I'm going to have her hold the device and treat her aneurysm. That gives her a lot of, empowers her over her disease and really demystifies it. The only challenge with this approach is that after she had done it once, she had said, well, shouldn't we be doing it this way? And I said, wait a minute, I'm the teacher here. <laughs> there is some downside to a lack of hierarchy. And, and so we can do that in practice. And if, for all parents in the room, any grandparents, please read this article on the making of an expert. It is a wonderful article. It really sums up a 30-year career of a sociologist, sociologist, Erickson, who studied how do you become a master. And I, I could talk on for a long time about this, but he studied violinists and actually studied many other domains. And really, it was deliberate practice and time that really made, made, made it possible. And we brought that deliberate practice. So once you print the pathology and you can actually practice on the disease, uh, the student on the left is having a really hard time sewing two vessels together. The student on the right is doing a very good job. We advise the student on the left to go into podiatry, but uh, that's a... <laughs> and 
And you, you can actually study this and give feedback. We actually brought a, a, a very famous tennis pro to our a lab last week and showed him this. He's really fascinated because this, this same kind of concept can be applied to athletes. And on the left, the patient's going to die. There's a plastic model. But on the right, the patient's going to live because it's a beautiful bypass. All, all bows down to a good technique and practice, practice, practice. And then we can bring that practice to the OR and perform operations. This patient then, patients can come to us from around the world now having practiced their operation. Our goal is we want to simulate and predict the outcome of the entire treatment before the patient even comes to Mayo Clinic. So the next step is mapping the human brain. When we deal with brain tumors, the challenge we have is that we can take off the whole tumor, but if we affect the function, we get a terrible outcome. So where do you draw that line? And that gets us into the, uh, the, the, the idea of using advanced imaging and brain mapping to create a better operation. And we can start to simulate this. So on the one hand, we want to resect as much tumor as possible. On the other hand, we don't want to affect brain function. So we can start, you know, Dr. Chong and his team lead a marvelous effort to map the human brain. We think of the brain as an amazing frontier for humanity, that along with space. And so now we can start to understand function. So you can take an opera singer, a singer that Dr. David Lott wrote, and start to map where in the brain is that vocal cord being controlled from. And that matters because if you're operating on a brain tumor, you don't want to affect that part of the brain that is controlling those vocal cords. And that, that's actually, a, we operated on an opera singer a couple years ago where that really came into play. And here you can start to map this in 3D. These are the cables that connect your cortex to the vocal cords. Really start, you know, the messages that went to David Lott's vocal cord really come through these fibers that come from the motor cortex. We have to map these when we're planning a brain operation. Here are the, all those connections in real time, uh, connecting all the centers of the brain. This is what makes the brain special. We can start to map these in color in 3D. And here's a simulated operation where you can map, plan your trajectory to a brain tumor, taking all those connections into account. Very, um, a much more precise operation than what we were taught when I was a student. We can actually, with, for the history of surgery, we've been using white light. We can now actually use fluorescence in the OR to see things we were not able to see with the naked eye. So this is a tumor that we uh, resected, and we thought we had done a good job. Uh, in white light, things look fine, but tumor cells don't respect white light. They know nothing about white light, so we can look in other wavelengths. We give an agent in the body uh, a couple hours before surgery. We switch the filter on the microscope. Now we can see things that we were not able to see with the naked eye. And now we see that we've left some tumor cells behind, so we can go ahead and resect those. So now, uh, another dimension of this whole idea of precision is mapping the human brain. So what we do is we put the people asleep, we put patients to sleep, we wake them up for the, diff for the delicate time of the brain surgery, uh, and I'm going to show you the case of a, uh, some musicians that were operated on at Mayo Clinic, while well, they can play their mu instruments during the procedure, because we want to preserve that higher level of brain function during the operation. And we know that this can enhance outcome. So this is a, a, a pianist from Phoenix. Uh, who really did not want to lose that function. She had a tumor in the music center of the brain, and here she's playing the keyboard. Uh, we're, we're going to try to put in the capital budget to get a better piano. Hopefully Dr. Chong has that on his radar. <laughs> and we've actually designed some new instruments to be able to, to map that function and, report, and, and show it on the MRI during the operation. This is just an experiment we've done. What about imaging during surgery? So now we can bring augmented reality. We can actually superimpose images and data into the operative field, as you see here. And uh, the idea of actually uh, getting an MRI during surgery. So we think we've done a good job. This is a room that's going to open in 2019 at Mayo Clinic, where during the operation, we think we've done a good job. We can then get an MRI in a room right next door and then bring that data back to the operation to make sure that we do a perfect job before we leave the OR. Again, at getting us closer to a precise operation. So currently, as it stands right now, these rooms, we do have an MRI at Mayo Clinic. We have an operating room. But the vision at Mayo Clinic is to bring these rooms together, as Dr. Chong mentioned earlier, all into one space so that we can marry imaging and surgery to, cr to bring us closer to that vision for precision surgery. What about the idea, so we can get an MR during surgery, what if you could operate in the MR scanner? What if you could see the anatomy as you were operating? So it's no longer relying on rote memory or a knowledge of anatomy. And so this is a patient with Parkinson's disease. We can actually, in the MR scanner, we can advance a catheter into the center of the brain that affects Parkinson's disease, and either place a stimulator. And what you see here, actually, in real time, and not many people in the world have seen this, infusing a drug into that center of the brain and watch it, watching it infuse uh, in real time. This is not a delayed image. I'm going to skip this just in the interest of time. What, and what I want to show you, I'm just going to skip a couple slides because we were running a little short on time. 
I'm going to talk to you a little bit in my, uh, I'm just going to show you a couple more slides about a very, another very important thing that's happening at Mayo Silicon. We're very involved with new technology development. So this whole concept of operating in the MR scanner, uh, we recently proposed an idea. What if you could remove brain hemorrhage in real time? So brain hemorrhage is a very important cause of stroke. And it's a very disabling cause of stroke, and it has a very high mortality. And we don't do a good job with traditional surgery of taking out that blood clot. It's very invasive to take it out. What if you could put a catheter in the MR scanner and reduce that blood clot in real time? So we propose this, and this is actually a recent experiment. Not too many people in the world have seen this. This has not yet been published. But we actually, what you're seeing here is in a model, a catheter going into a clot in the brain, and it's being evacuated in real time. This happens to be cranberry sauce, but the idea is that we're going to bring this to market. We're actually going to the FDA soon to try to get this device approved. So on that note, uh, I want to end you with a message of hope. So what does this all mean? So what all this means is hopefully better outcomes for you and your loved ones and for patients. And, and what all these advances mean is that we can do what I was taught was impossible. So a couple months ago, I was called by a 100-year-old patient who had suffered a big stroke. A big blood clot had traveled from the heart to the brain. And what that does is it, it stops blood flow to the brain, and that can result in a fatal or very disabling stroke. So I was called because this patient had come to the ER, and the family had heard about our ability to remove blood clots from the brain with new technology uh, and reopen flow to the brain to hopefully reduce the size of the stroke or prevent a stroke from happening at all. But when I heard the patient was 100, I was a little hesitant. I called Dr. Chong and Dr. Krishna, my other partner, said, should we really do this? We walked into the ER as a team, and, and the patient's family said, we know, we've heard about this technology. We know she's 100, but she would want this. She's a fighter. I said, OK, let's give it a try. Sorry about that. And so what I'm going to show you now is my in So we went ahead and did it. And in fact, she did improve over the, coming, the several days after the procedure. What I'm going to show you now is my interview with her. And I'm going to show you our birthday party that we had for her uh, soon after this video. So Charlie is 100 years old, and this is her uh, maybe two months after the procedure. So Charlie, it's so great to see you. It's great to see you because now I get to see you really clearly. And you're responsible for the new adage that we have uh, that uh, 100 is the new 60. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, when you came in with a closed brain vessel, uh, as a blood clot that went to your brain, and it closed off a major highway that supplies blood to your brain, and that is often a final event. I imagine it is. And thanks to some new technology and the program we've developed here at Mayo Clinic, we were able to go in very quickly, open that vessel again by retrieving, taking out the clot. Well, because of your age, we were uh, a little bit worried, uh, but we knew from the beginning your family told us that you were a fighter, and they actually were very confident that you were going to be okay. And as the days went by and you started to improve, we became believers as well. And that's where the, the saying 100 is a new 60 came from. So we were thinking to make actually some, uh, okay. some badges uh, around that idea. Okay. So how are you feeling? How have you been since I saw you last? I've been very well. I haven't had any problems at all. I'm enjoying everything I did before. I really am. I, uh, I have uh, 14 grandchildren. Wow. They're very close, okay. especially the girls. You know, they, I have one granddaughter that calls me every night. And really? I, I call to my son every morning and every I night. didn't tell my mother that. That's wow, so, that's amazing. So I keep in touch with what they're doing, what their family's doing. Well, we're so glad that we got you in time. I am too. Because time, when, it, when, when a brain vessel is closed, time is of the essence. I know that. And the faster we get it open, the better. I know that. And so in your case, I think things work out really well. So, I'm just indebted to them for taking such good care of me. Well, thank you for saying that. Yes, I really your, am. Your, your recovery has uh, energized many, many people, from nursing to staff, other staff, and doctors, and students. And, uh, yeah, I hope so. And you know, what, what the procedure you had wasn't possible maybe five to 10 years ago. No. Thanks to newer technologies, we were able to open up your brain vessel very quickly. And so we're very pleased to see how well you're doing. I know, but I owe a lot to you too. Well, thank you for saying yes, that. Yes, I really do. Because I just know that uh, uh, if I'm in your care, I'm in the best. Well, thank you. Thank you. That, that. 
So we just celebrated uh, a month ago, Pam, I don't know if she's here, put on a beautiful, almost wedding-like uh, party for her, 101th birthday. Uh, it was really quite nice. We opened up these two rooms and it was uh, her whole extended family came. It was very nice. Um, and, and I was trying to, what well, you don't see in the video, I was trying to get some of her secrets, maybe it could help me and my family. So I, I said, uh, so uh, how often do you work out? Do you go to the gym often? She goes, uh, so she said, I never got into that whole gym thing, but uh, he goes, maybe I should. And my, <laughs> and, and my, and my team was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Wow, that's, uh, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? Um, some great innovations. Uh, but what Dr. Lott showed and what Dr. Bendock showed and some of the other wonderful things that are going on at Mayo Clinic are only possible because of our partnership and collaboration with our scientists. Um, the next person I'm gonna introduce to you um, is a scientist. She's a mathematician. And uh, my parents always wanted me to be a mathematician because they thought that mathematics was the way things were going to go. And to be honest with you, a lot of the big innovations of the last probably 100 years have their roots in mathematics. So Dr. Kristen Swanson is going to come and talk to us about how she and her group are changing how we care for cancer patients using mathematics. And she's promised that there are no equations. <laughs> Maybe one. Okay. Okay. It's going to be a really long one, though, I know. Please welcome Dr. Kristen Swanson. All right. So I brought a prop. We can pass it around later today. Uh, if I can turn on the mic. Ooh, now you can probably hear me. Now you can hear a lot of me. Okay. Uh, uh, whenever. Now is good. Okay. Yeah, pass good. it around. Uh, just try not to rub them together. Uh, no, I'll explain it during. Let's, okay. let's be. It's a mystery right now. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, sticking around um, and still being awake um, and not fleeing immediately from the room when you heard a mathematician might be here. So, um, <laughs> I am hoping today that I can um, maybe convince you of the value in math to precision or individualized medicine. Um, and I'm going to focus that uh, posit on um, by uh, talking primarily about a certain type of cancer. Um, but I, can, I wanted to give you a little history about how I come to math meets cancer. Uh, and here's the history. Um, my father, my brother, <laughs> my other brother, my aunt, my mother-in-law, all of us know cancer. All of us have lost many family members, I'm sure, uh, to cancer because it's the sad state of the world. Um, that said, uh, I don't have to convince you that cancer is an important challenge that we need to tackle. But what I will convince you, I hope, <laughs> at the end of this uh, presentation is that math can uh, provide value in this equation. And one of the reasons that's the case is because of this whole concept of individualized medicine, right? Uh, we all know each of these patients are different. We know each of our loved ones diagnosed with cancer A, B, lung, brain, whatever. Um, they're all different, right? And everybody kind of has a different course. But at the end of the day, the way we've approached can cancer and really any clinical care over the last decades has been based on this. If you have a diagnosis of gray, in this case, pick a cancer, um, we get a cohort of similar patients together. And they're similar because they all have the same diagnosis. Um, and they might have some other features that are similar, but ultimately uh, we make a decision about what's going to happen to those individual patients, each one being different, um, by looking at that patient smack dab in the middle. So what you see here is a survival curve. On the y-axis here is the percent of the patient surviving, x-axis is some survival time, and every step is a patient that expires with this disease. But they're all the same patients, right? They're all receiving the same treatment. They're all having the same diagnosis. So what I mean, what I w mean here is the patient in the middle is the average patient. But nobody's average, right? That was certainly not my experience. My father actually uh, was very accelerated in his disease course. My brother, who had the same exact diagnosis, moved a little bit past the median. And my other brother was way out on the tail. Um, and this is true across every cancer. But there is a way we can bring some sort of quantitative methods, uh, some math, <laughs> to be able to bring an individualized understanding of 
what's different about each of these patients into how to best treat each of these individual patients. So here's another, here's a specific, specific visualization of the heterogeneity we see how every patient is different with the type of cancer that we're looking at. The type of cancer I focus on is primary brain tumors known as glioblastoma. They're very, very nasty tumors. Uh, they have a median survival of something like 18 months. So the, the green patient is 18 months, 15 months. Um, there are some, there are several uh, recent um, patients um, that have been in the, in the news a lot with this particular disease, um, but they're all different, everybody's different. Um, and what you see here plotted on the y-axis is the size of the tumor, okay? We're all scaled them all to the size one at the start of the treatment. Um, and then the, all these patients are gonna receive exactly the same treatment. They're gonna receive radiation and chemotherapy followed by a lot of chemotherapy until they progress. Um, but everybody is different on this curve, right? You have a patient down here that's orange that continued, continued to respond to the therapy for a very long period of time. And the patient at the top of the curve didn't care about the therapy and just kept growing, right? Um, and right now, clinically, and any other organization, we basically have no we means to tell the difference between the patient at the top of the curve that's not gonna care about the therapy and the patient at the bottom of the curve. Um, but what our lab is focused on is really trying to separate out these two, these two things. Can we identify which one of these patients are gonna be before we treat them and match them to the right treatment? And to do that, uh, we need to build some predictive understanding of what's gonna happen in each of these patients. Uh, so that's where the word uh, simulation and mathematical modeling come into play. What makes this disease all that more, much more challenging is that imaging, what we see on an MRI, only shows us a portion of what the actual tumor is. So what we call it the tip of the iceberg. If you see in the white on the top, that's what you see on MRI for a given patient. The true extent of the iceberg for the patient is on the bottom. So red is low cell density, so if you biopsy in those red regions, you'd only run into a few tumor cells, but there's tumor cells there. If you biopsy in the white regions, there's a lot of tumor cells there. Um, and so that gradient is a problem. It's a problem for everything we do, because at the end of the day, clinicians are, we, we're facing knowledge, uh, we're facing, we're tracking individual patients using images like that on the top, when the disease reality is that on the bottom. So how do we m match those um, to those, those, distance between those differences um, to the right therapy for each patient. And so this is where the math comes in. So I think equation will actually pop up. I don't think I deleted it. <laughs> um, but, um, so just forewarning. Uh, in, in this visual here, is, that's a 3D reconstruction of the brain. Um, your one uh, brain is probably wandering around the room at the moment. Um, and the, 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 real, uh, the visualization of that will become clear just momentarily. And in red is what you see on MRI. So that's the tip of the iceberg on MRI, okay? Um, if you zoom in to the little voxel, the little volume of tissue, so you know, like a cubic millimeter by a cubic a millimeter by a millimeter by a millimeter sort of size volume of tissue, if you zoom in that, that volume of tissue, this is actually what's happening in a day. If you watch the video loop, that's 24 hours. The cells are migrating many cell lengths. They're going many cell bodies away from themselves um, within one day, right? And this is exactly smack dab in the middle of what you see in patients with glioblastoma. So that's the real challenge. That's the reason there is this iceberg problem, right? The cells are also fleeing in addition to their proliferative capacity. But if you look at this as, through the lens of being a mathematician, you, this is just a complex system of interacting agents. They're cells, they have strategies, they have some sort of rule system that you can write down in terms of equations, because ultimately math and physics is the basis of all things. Um, and you write down those candidate rules and you figure out if they fit, what's actually happening in the patients, and that's all there is to it. Um, so there's the equation. Yeah, okay, I didn't delete it. <laughs> um, so uh, you can basically write down these individual rules as the rate of change, in, in this case, it, written in words are, is the math. Um, uh, the rate of change of the local tumor cell density in these regions is given to by the dispersal of the cells, which we see very clearly here, right? The cells are migrating a lot. Um, the proliferation of those cells, because um, they're doubling, they're cancer, so they have to be doubling. And hopefully they're responding to the therapy we're giving them. And so we really want to know what's going on in that last term. But ultimately, everything you're gonna see from this point on, forward comes from this really relatively simple equation. This is the model where I don't know where it's gone in the room. Um, it's, uh, so basically, this is an actual patient, um, patient's brain, uh, printed, 
with a 3D printer um, and, and, uh, in sandstone. Um, and what the color represents is that shape of the iceberg. So the dark red here, the very darkest red you see, is what you see on MRI. That's the tip of the iceberg. Um, all the other colors is that diffuse invasion you see in all the other cases. But we can do this in, in, for individual patients. We can then match this with the surgical resection that the patient received or where the radiation was received for the patients. We can overlay all that information and then have patient individualized uh, understanding of what's happening to this individual patient, give them some sense of where they're at and wh wh why we're taking the approaches we're taking for, for, um, for each patient, um, but also having some predictive understanding of what we can't see. So that's step, that's step one. But we can also move this forward in time. So now let's think about a surgery when we have only a tip of the iceberg view of the MRI. Um, turns out when you look at all these patients, some of the patients have an iceberg shape like this, very shallow lots of diffuse invasion, and other patients have very steep icebergs. Um, so when you do a surgery on those two different patients, right, it matters that you've got a few cells left behind for the steep iceberg, and you've got a lot of cells left behind with the shallow iceberg. And that's what this actually shows. Basically, the standard surgical approaches, if we did whatever we were, we're not doing here, but um, what do you, what you do out in the, uh, in the broader world um, to, to treat this disease, the strategy is to remove the tip of the iceberg, that kind of white abnormality you see inside the green loop. But you can see the distance between uh, the green loop here is the extent of the iceberg that you would have to remove to remove 99% of the tumor cells in the brain. Um, and so green and a green and the white area are pretty close together. So what the MRI shows is actually a pretty good component of what the disease is for patients like that. But for patients like this, where their icebergs are really shallow, what you see on the MRI is really small compared to the actual tumor extent. So surgery here, meaning just removing the white part, is way different than in terms of value than it is up here. And in fact, up here, we're probably almost doubling the patient's survival, 75% increase in survival in this horrible disease. But we're drowning out the signal with patients that are getting suboptimal surgeries. So by having this predictive understanding beforehand, where we can print out the iceberg and tell you where the diffuse distribution is, that informs the surgical decision making. It also informs things like radiation response. So you can forecast not only where the disease is, but where it's going over time in these individual patients. Um, this is the same exact same patient examples. You can see the tip of the iceberg red. You can see the high cell density area very, very clearly because the blue cell, low cell density areas are very close by. But here, the blue low cell density areas are far away from the red. And so you can hardly see the red. So having a predictive understanding provides us insights that we couldn't have had any other way. You can use, use these forecasts to say, hey, in this patient, if I'd have done nothing, this is what would have happened to this patient. There's the, blue, the, blue, uh, the gray curve. But look how much smaller the tumor is than we expected. And it turns out this does something interesting as well. So if you compare currently, again, thinking of those clinical trials where we have the gray patients, right, and they're all the same, right? Now in a clinical trial, we've got some new therapy and we're testing whether therapy A is working in patient A, uh, patient one, okay? Um, the way they do that is they compare this. How much smaller is the tumor than it was before? We don't care how fast it was growing, we just care is it smaller or bigger. Turns out, it doesn't matter how much smaller it is before because it matters if you're growing really fast or really slow in the first place. The degree to which you're smaller it, um, only gives you a part of the equation, right? Um, and it turns out that that degree which the tumor is smaller doesn't really correlate with survival, doesn't predict that that patient's going to do well. That's why it's so hard to get new therapies because you could get a, do a clinical trial and you can't tell, oh, wait, this cohort of patients received a lot of benefit from this trial and they lived long. That connection is not, does not exist. But if you ask the connection, what is the degree to which we've tilted the tumor off of its growth curve, what it would have done, turns out it matters very well, it highly correlates with survival and predicts what patients um, are going to ultimately do. So now you've got some new therapy that you've developed in the lab and you want to put it, put it into these individual patients. You can measure, the, by measuring the deviation of the tumor off of its growth path um, using these mathematical models, you can measure not only how well they responded to this individual therapy, but how that translated to improved outcomes for the patient, which is connecting the dots that's essential to advance um, precision medicine. You can do the same thing where you can predict which patients are ra radiation sensitive and, and uh, radiation resistant. Turns out the patient on the top was sensitive, but the patient on the bottom was not. You see their tumor didn't deflect hardly at all off of their growth curve for the treated patient on the bottom. Where, but if, when they were treated with radiation, the tumor was much, very responsive to the radiation on the top. 
So the patient at the top was good fit for radiation, good fit for surgery, but not so good to fit a chemotherapy, it turns out. The patient on the bottom was the chemotherapy, was the, the, the winner for that patient. But yet, each of these patients were rece receiving standard of care therapies. They were receiving what a combination of these when only one or two or three of them, one or, one or two of them were, were the, one, the right match for that individual patient. So here's the pie in the sky dream. This is where we're going, is to take um, an iPad app or equivalent, um, some useful tools so certain you can get physicians in the room uh, for what we call tumor board uh, to make the next clinical decision for any given patient. Um, the surgical team comes in and they have a plan and on day 20 they're going to, they are loading their plan into the system, uh, their surgical plan. Then we have the radiation therapists, they come in with their plan and we're going to load that into the system. The chemotherapist in this particular patient example, this actual patient did not receive uh, chemotherapy, um, and have a predictive understanding of, of what's going to happen to that individual patient. There's the temporal lobectomy for the patient, followed by there's the radiation melting the tumor away, and then recurrence. So although this is a patient-specific simulation, there are data points of MRIs along the curve. So this is actually what happened to this individual patient. But if we know this, hand, this beforehand, can we go and tweak how we approach the radiation, add on a different chemotherapy that we have some knowledge of, change how our surgery is, do less of a surgery, do more of a surgery. Um, all of those simulations can be played out beforehand to be able to best optimize the, and match this patient to the right therapy. So that's the overall vision of where we're going. Um, these are the people that help uh, make sure that we are um, above water and still staffing uh, people to actually do this work. These are all the folks that are doing it. This is actually a, a, an old picture. We have evolved very quickly, so there's a lot more folks, but you should come visit us. We're directly across the, um, in the back, um, back parking lot in the support services building. And um, I was asked to present um, what some of the visionary opportunities might be within our group. There's obvious opportunities with regards to funds um, for um, specific projects. This iPad app is a perfect example. Um, how do we build, uh, integrate our models into the OR more seamlessly? We're doing this through augmented reality tools, is one example. Um, and then there's always uh, the challenge with federal grants. You get a grant and then they cut you 20% every year, um, which does mean that there's like nothing left at the end. <laughs> it is sad but true. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's if you're in the top 5% to actually get the grant and not doing, and um, yeah, so it's, inter it's, it's a challenging, challenging uh, endeavor. Um, we also are very, obviously, keenly interested in building bridges between mathematics and cancer biology and the clinic. Um, and to do that, you need to train people at that interface. And so we populate a ton of folks in our lab who are at this interface where they come from neuroscience, but now all of a sudden they leave with math mathematics and computational knowledge. Or they come from IT and they leave with um, un understanding of cancer biology that is, is, for, is, you know, is uh, without compete. Um, and so bu building bridges at, the, at this interface is really important. And so fellow, finding fellows um, to, to populate that space is really important. Um, and then obviously um, maintaining a stable base for the overall lab is, is something that's essential to keep the machine going and not, um, I think uh, Dr. Lott made the comment of not living from uh, grant to grant. <laughs> so thank you very much. Again, I just keep saying wow today. Um, Dr. Bernard, or Ben Doc had to leave for a uh, patient that was having an acute stroke. So he's on call. I'm not on call anymore. So he's taking care of that patient. That was the pager that went off. Exactly. Yeah, that okay. was the pager that went off. So uh, I will take questions on his behalf. But are there any questions for Dr. Swanson right now? Yes, sir. Could you be looking at genomic data? Yes, we definitely do. Um, so we, uh, what we've, what I press represented here was basically the phenotype of the disease, right? So how fast is it doing whatever it's doing? Underlying all that is all the genetics, right? Ultimately, genetics, epigenetics, and, and the environment are all driving how the cells choose that. And so we have an entire, we just received a new NIH grant um, focused on that, on bridging that using image localized biopsies that Bernard is collecting. two points yep. t to measure that? So, true. Um, but, so my but, question is, how far apart do you do that, or are you just... 
So that's actually where I started in this um, in this area, right? So I was very interested in this disease kinetics story. So I built, I think, the world's largest database of patients for which I have that knowledge of what happens given uh, over two time points before any treatment comes in. Um, so we have about 2,500 patients in that database and probably like 35,000 segmented MRIs plus another 35,000 that need to be segmented, hence the reason I have 20 ASU students in my lab at any one time. Um, the point was is it used to be that you had to have two time points um, to be able to predict that. But we've built so much data behind it, we've be, 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 basically been able to connect imaging features that tell you, well, eh, you're kind of on a growth curve like this versus this. So we can now do it using other features of the disease. One of those features is um, necrosis. Basically, you can't have an aggressive tumor. Um, a t tumor has to be a certain amount of, gr of aggress aggressive in order for the tumor to form necrosis. And when you use that as control um, and other Im imaging features, you can basically tell you what curve you're on. But yes, that used to be used to be the case. Yeah. Thankfully, that's not. You guys have been unbelievably patient. It's after four, and you're all still here. You can. You would speak for each of the speakers, but I'll ask you a macro question. Um, what is your vision of just take what we talked about today of medicine in five to seven years? Uh, within our space, it is definitely a two, two things. In five to seven years, I hope that we will, can usurp this, this um, clinical trial structure where we can build clinical structures that are informed by simulation, right? Where you can say, um, I can match patients to therapies using this vast data we have, right? Whether that's through artificial intelligence, whether that's through mechanistic mathematical modeling that I showed you here, et cetera. I think that is an essential um, step for progress because if we leave patients as the gray pile, Right? We're never going to get down to that individual um, uh, in, a, in a predictive way. Um, I think that's, uh, I definitely see that happening. I think we have no choice but to have that happen when you think of genomics, right, and, and the N of one that comes under, like, only one person has this genetic signature. How do, you, how do you have some predictive understanding of what's going to happen in those patients? And I think that's currently the missing link, frankly, um, in individualized medicine. It's the reason we're doing what we're doing. I think that is, is central. I'm probably extremely biased, but that's my... <laughs> I think from the uh, clinical perspective, we don't know what we don't know. And so assembling really diverse collaborative teams, these types of relationships between mathematicians and other scientists and clinicians really leads to the best discoveries. I mean, a lot of the things that we thought were impossible as clinicians, when we collaborate with our scientists, we find out that, no, they're really close to being possible. And so we can push the envelope in that way. Uh, that's one specific thing. The other specific thing, I think, is, is what Dr. Bendock spoke on and what Dr. Lott spoke on as well, is that through regeneration and through simulation, we can practice things before we actually do things. And we can get better at things before we put anything or anyone at risk. And importantly, through that process, we not only save time, but we save resources. And that time savings can translate a lot of these wonderful inventions into the clinical realm much quicker than we used to be able to. You know, the lead time, one of the questions I had for both Dr. Lott and Dr. Bendock and Dr. Swanson really are, you know, these great ideas. In the past, it's taken us a quarter of a century to translate them to the bedside. And now we're seeing these accelerated translational times of three to five years before something gets commercialized or gets implemented in a clinical study. So I think rather than the specific ideas or the specific inventions are more the concepts, changing the way we think, the way we practice, thinking smarter, thinking better. Any other questions? Well, I'd like to make some closing statements. Um, I think this has been just an incredible, incredible experience for me. I'm not even talking about you guys yet. I mean, I have learned <laughs> so much today. And you know, my daughter always says, Daddy, what did you learn today? And I said, no, the question is, what did you learn today? She's always trying to turn the tables on me. Um, how many of you learned something today? Everybody learned something? Good. Awesome. How many of you learned something that you thought was impossible? Wow, that's amazing. That's wonderful. And, and I did too, and it takes a lot to surprise me working in this hospital for a long time because we have a lot of great innovators here. Um, so this was really about today how we really make the impossible things possible. 
And we do that with the generous support of many of you people in this room. We do that through our campaign drives. Our UR campaign is well on the way to more than successful completion by the end of the year. We still have a little ways to go, and we're hoping with your help we're going to exceed those expectations. But more importantly, I think today what we talked about is how we can help our patients. And what I learned today is that that's each other. That's all of us in this room, myself included. So really, this philanthropy spins around and comes full circle and helps each one of us every single day. It allows us to turn the impossible into possible. It allows us to take that jump off the precipice. We are on the verge of so many great discoveries right now. It's amazing. You're just hearing what's happening at Mayo Clinic. And it allows us to take that jump and it allows us to do it in a very, very special environment, Mayo Clinic. It allows us to take those inventions and to deliver our special kind of care, which I think as a patient, I'm glad that I get that care too. So I wanna thank all of you for your support and your friendship. That's very important to us. It allows us to continue to do what we do every day. I'd ask that uh, there are many development people in the room. I'd ask all of you to stand up and to wave your hands uh, vigorously. <laughs> They help us um, make friends with people like you. And I would like you to give them some feedback. Each of you have in your packets um, a feedback form. It's very, very useful. Consider that your menu for our next Behind the Shields event because it tells us what you would like to hear and how you would like to hear it. And it helps us make our next event even better than today's event. So please fill out those forms. You can either hand them to one of the development officers or you can mail them in. <laughs> Lastly, on behalf of Mayo Clinic, I really want to thank you personally for your attendance today, for your belief and your trust in us to do the right thing with your generosity. And I want you to thank you for coming and spending time with us. Look forward to seeing all of you next year, okay? Thanks again, bye-bye.